great, that's a great uh, story. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Deb Nazette and we're going to get uh, cracking with the final uh, few or today. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's been a great day and um, as Michael said, we're on the final stretch. So here we go. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the professional capability program, um, except to say it's excellent. And um, I think by now too, you've probably realised that uh, workforce sustainability, practice innovation uh, can't happen without a capable workforce. So there's a lot of overlap in our programs and we all work together to make it happen, to make those outcomes happen for consumers out there in all of the healthcare services um, with your help. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to get straight into the first presenter. We are running a little bit behind time. So I welcome Andrew instead to uh, Bruce Field to the mic. Um, a bit about Anne. Anne has been a passionate midwife for 31 years and has worked in a range of maternity care environments from rural to metropolitan, almost everything in between. Some of you might know Anne. As a country girl, she's passionate about providing safe maternity services for rural women and their families. Anne headed a team which restructured maternity services in Roma from a ward-based model to a full continuity of the midwifery care model. Anne is now the clinical midwifery consultant for the Southwest Hospital and Health Service and oversees professional standards for maternity care in the three birthing hubs of Roma, St George and Charleville. Without any further ado, please welcome Anne. Thank you very much everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I just thought I'd really correct the misconception. Um, my flight this morning was actually cancelled. I didn't miss it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm off the back and I didn't want to give you the wrong idea. So, <laughs> so it was cancelled. We had a face-to-face -face meeting of um, all of our passionate midwives from the southwest, from our three birthing sites in Roma, Charles and St George. And these midwives provide continuity of care for all women accessing maternity services in the southwest. This means that every woman is allocated a midwife who um, is a primary carer and works in collaboration with a wider disciplinary team. In our model, there's, and there's, there's, a, there's different variations between, between the models, but in our model, um, this women have three required antenatal contacts with a senior medical officer in obstetrics, and um, also there's a dis meeting once a week, a multidisciplinary meeting, where cases are reviewed and um, plans of um, care are discussed. We also have access to a flying obstetrician that's required. Um, the midwife otherwise works autonomously in a midwife-led um, model and she works according to the National Midwifery Guidelines for consultation and referral and we ensure that our midwives, we try to make it that our midwives only work in partnerships of two or at the most three because once we get to four then continuity is um, significantly compromised and research is fairly clear about that. We have variations in the way that our models are operationalised in our three services um, and that depends on a number of things, even from you know, the structure of the hospital, you know, whether the ward and the maternity service are close together or further apart. Um, there's an influence on the wider hospital community, there's consumer influences, and there's also our bugbear, which is recruitment of midwives. Because midwives don't grow on trees. Um, under the clinical services capability framework, um, we're designated as a level three birthing service, which means that we have relatively low risk care across the pregnancy continuum, and we also have we also look after high risk antenatal and postnatal, and for those women that have to go away to birth in a larger facility, those women that are high risk now, their, their lives have been just so much made so much easier by telehealth. So instead of travelling down for you know appointments long distance for every antenatal appointment, every second antenatal appointment, we telehealth with an obstetrician or physician in the receiving hospital. So, you know, when, when um, Dr. Scott before was talking about, you know, the amazing advances in telehealth, it just improves the quality of life of rural people um, incredibly. Look, we actually now have, a, have an iPad in Roma that our graduate midwives take out in our home visits and take out to outreach centres so that if they need to call back in and talk to a senior midwife or a senior medical officer, 
Belgium to Dahl and, and you're giving us assistance and advice. Just so that those women don't have to, um, you know, sort of be packed up and brought in or, you know, for something that's really not that, not, not that serious. larger than the state of Victoria by about up to about 20 percent I believe and so here we have um, that's our service but here we have Roma which is in the east which is a six hour drive from Brisbane we've got St George down here which is a two hour drive south of Roma and then Charleville which is three another three hours three hours west so um, Roma we have a, we have a hub and a spoke model so our three birthing services are hub but our midwives will also um, in Roma, they will visit Injun, Mitchell, Wallambilla and Surat. And the St George midwives will service Bolham during Bandy and Mungandai. And the Charwell midwives have the furthest to travel. They go to Orkinbella, Morgan, Quilty and Kanamala. So you can see they've really got, um, um, they're very well travelled midwives. So to balance out the travel and the workloads, we make sure that our midwives will get about 30 women a year. You'll find in the metropolitan areas, where you've got a low risk model, that that will be about, they'll, they'll, they'll be 40 women a year for a case of midwives. And we find that about 30 a year is probably about right. And a lot of rural services are saying the same thing. Um, in, the, in the metropolitan areas too, with the NGP models, if they're, if they're high risk or all risk, then they'll have reduced caseloads accordingly. So while it's difficult to compare rural and metropolitan MGPs, it's also really difficult to compare rural MGPs with other rural MGPs. Some will have two models, a concurrent model of a core midwifery staff where you've got a rostered midwife on shift 24 hours a day, and also the MGP. Um, and then there's single services like ours that don't have the birthing numbers to support um, two models. We just have um, one MGP. Now, the charitable service was a bit like Gundawindi. Gundawindi was almost going to close at one stage until they brought in an MGP. And that's the same with Charleville, but only, we only have a service now because we have a very successful midwifery group practice. In single site models such as ours, there's always a tension um, between, around the fact that there's a midwife not in the building 24 seven. So we actually train all our nurses to provide basic maternity care. And that's usually for the stable inpatient woman who is um, sort of just really sitting around. She might be a couple of hours away. We don't want to go because we have a neonatal screen on the dot of 48 hours. So we just have, you know, they'll be, they'll be um, sitting in hospital. So um, it's, it's, there are some purists, and can I put my hand up as being a midwife purist? Um, we find it challenge or have found it challenging for getting nursing staff to provide maternity care. But, you know, we have to be really strategic about how we um, might have a resource to even maintain a maternity service at all. So it's just not feasible to have a midwife sitting in the building for 48 hours with one woman who's stable and then not having enough midwifery resources to provide care for a woman who's coming in in labour. Continuity midwifery care is incontrovertible. Now, Kathy Styles took a bit of my thunder earlier, but that's okay. Um, we, can, we can repeat it, Kathy. Uh, so, but we see the Lancet and the Cochrane data review. They show that every single outcome is improved with continuity midwifery care. There's less epidurals, there's less pain relief required, there's less episiotomies, there's less instrumental births, um, there's less postnatal depression, increased breastfeeding. There are some really startling benefits, and that is, you know, less growth restricted babies and less preterm babies. Now, that is phenomenal. There is no other intervention that reduces preterm birth. And preterm birth is a huge burden on the health system. There's, you know, many mega bucks go into looking after preterm babies. The Australian government in 2009 actually pointed out or recommended that publicly funded um, maternity service should provide continuity midwifery care um, as part of their models of funding. So then we asked the question, why is there a 100% everywhere? And, you know, well, there's a number of reasons for that, but I'm, I'm just going to sort of cover a, a couple. 
essentially is very, very challenging. Um, having one recruitment group practice model integrated into a rural health service means that it has to be a whole hospital model. So you have to have the nurses on side, you have to have the, the medical staff on side, you know, you have to have everyone working together and coming together as a team. And that can actually be very, very challenging. There's varying levels of medical support, varying levels of recruitment support, and there's very varying levels of nurse and nurse leader support for this as well. We find that some medical officers are just incredibly supportive and others aren't. Some medical officers know and really respect the literacy scope of practice and others don't and they'll undermine it. So those sorts of things um, can, can cause great problems, especially when you might have a change of, for example, medical staff and you find your continuity of literacy care being eroded overnight and, you know, you'll have disillusioned, powerless midwives feeling very demoralised. And we know that that's from, from our statewide work, we know that that's happen, has happened quite a bit. Um, we have some midwives who don't want to work in this type of model, and so, um, and, and, you know, and, and there's, you know, they don't have to, we don't make midwives work in these models, but when, you, when that's the only model you have in that, um, in that town, then um, you really, you know, they, can, they can, can work in other areas, but that's a bit of a problem when you've got bachelor literacy trained midwives. So we also have that there are some nurses and nurse leaders who actually don't believe in continuity literacy care. It's sort of a little bit inconvenient, and um, and they may or may not support bachelor midwives, bachelor literacy trained midwives, um, despite the increasing evidence that it's producing some really outstanding graduates. Um, some universities produce more outstanding graduates than others. Um, there's this belief that if you need, if you're going to work rurally, you have to work in all areas. You have to be able to go to the ED, you have to be going to the acute ward, you have to be able to whiz up to theatre and do something up there. But um, you know, this is just not the case. If you've got your model structured so that you're providing continuity literary care, you don't need that uh, midwife to be able to um, work across all areas. I noticed uh, that in the, one of the latest midwifery journals, the you know, Emeritus Professor Leslie Barclay, who's one of the foremost maternity researchers in this country in rural, for rural, was saying that holding on to this perception is actually um, a bit of a symptom of poor leadership. So she was starting to probably get stuck in there. <laughs> um, you know, like I, could, I'm, I can go down to the emergency department and I can hold up a leg for a, a medical officer who's putting on a plaster cast. I can check emergency drugs, I can check drugs for emergency staff. You know, I can do those simple sort of things, but I'm not going to get involved in complex areas such as interpreting an ECG, for example. Just like I wouldn't expect a registered nurse in the ED to provide woman labour care for all in labour, but I would be able to expect her to come and, you know, whack in a few cannulas for us if we're short staffed and we've got a postpartum hemorrhage happening. So it's just a matter of getting everyone working together using the um, skills and knowing the scope of practice of all your clinicians. So look, can I just say, the South West has really been able to demonstrate a very structure of models that all midwives, including bachelor of literary midwives, can be really effective in rural sites. So that for us, that is not an issue anymore, but I do understand that it still tends to be an issue nationally. There's evidence that continuity literary care expedites learning in students and graduates. Actually, there's really good evidence for that. And our graduate midwives receive really excellent um, experiences when they work in a rural MGP. We had one of our graduates last year compare herself to what was happening to her colleagues that were now in Brisbane, and she was way, way ahead. Um, we, we've, um, we see efforts across the state to remedicalise continuity of literary models of care and um, and so we're working so that we can get our consumers really on board because consumers are key. We've seen time and time again in Queensland where consumers, when a, when a midwife model of care has been shut down within 24 hours, you've got a couple of hundred consumers out the front with placards and yahooing and all that <laughs> stuff and before you know it that model's back open, up, open again. So, you know, it really is the key. So women will love continuity of care. They vote with their feet. And um, it's interesting, I, I see, and I note some researchers also talking about this as well now, that you know, there are places that say our women don't want continuity of care, they're not interested in it, um, it doesn't you know, thrill them or whatever. But we really have to question what sort of information they've been given because everywhere else where they implement such a model, within months it's oversubscribed and you cannot provide the midwives to be able to support those women who want that. So consumers are really, really powerful. 
and um, we haven't made the best use of our consumers over the years, but um, we've now got um, some consumers being mentored now by, in, in the South West, being mentored by um, some, you know, the presidents of the, some of the consumer networks here in uh, Brisbane. I'm just going to finish by telling you a story last year from Roma, where Roma presented at what we call Turning the Tide, which is an Australian College of Midwives um, education evening once a month, and you would know, can video conference around the whole state. And we had this woman who is a consumer who uses very colourful language, and um, she got up there and she said that if they insert colourful language, um, get rid of this model in Roma, then I'm going to be strapping myself and chaining myself by stairs and they get it back. I'm not going to more colourful language and I stand for that. Um, and, and this was a woman who, um, who despite met her great efforts, did not achieve a vaginal birth after caesarean. She actually had another repeat caesarean. Um, but she was so impressed by that model that, um, that um, she... Um, she felt that her emotional wounds and all the psychological issues she had as a result um, were so much better cared for and she was able to recover so much quickly than the first emergency caesarean she had. So just getting back to our midwives, um, you know, women love continuity of care and this is our team of South West midwives who are really passionate about providing it. Consumers get there onto the steering groups and they say, this is what we want. I was just, just recently, last week, I think I was on a working group for what came out of the working group that came out of the Paternity Forum in November last year. And they would have these things, they would say, women will be included in decision making. And the consumers got up there and they said, we don't want to be included, we will be making the decision, thank you very much. And that got changed straight away. Yeah. So consumers are so important. Any further questions or comments for Amy? Okay, well join me in thanking you.